welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I got to say that music kind of gets me jazzed up. And I'm really jazzed to have Claire Axelrad, JDCFRE, woman extraordinaire, coming back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Hello, my friend. Hello. Thank you. Claire, it's been a while since you've been on. I was going back through my records, and I think it's been almost two years and um, I remember when we had you on, I was so intrigued by some of the things that you said, and I really loved your mindset. And so when we started chatting again and kind of renewing our, our uh, acquaintance, um, you made this comment and it just blew my mind. It's like, do nonprofits think too small? And I was like, wow, we need to have this discussion because this is powerful. So we're going to go through this. We're going to get your opinions on why we think uh, maybe it's time for a reset uh, for some of us, for our leadership, and, and really get into it. Before we get into it, we want to make sure we thank our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our newest episodes on Fridays, and 180 Management Group. We have this amazing new cohort of co-hosts, say that fast three times. They're from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse. They work in different parts of the nonprofit sector and they are mesmerizing. I hope you have uh, enjoyed meeting them throughout this debut um, that we've had with them over the last two months. But we're also debuting Claire Axelrad back to us after a, a hiatus with clarification. Welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be here. You know, this is probably one of the best names out there in terms of a business. Clarification. Holy moly. Do we all need that, right, Claire? It's what I what's what I try to bring, you know. I've I've been in I've been in the trenches for 30 years as direct as director of development and then over 10 years now as a coach and a consultant. And, you know, I, I've just seen a lot of stuff that I want to share with people. And now that I have a sort of outside looking in, it's easier to see what I couldn't see when I was inside. So wow. that's what I try to help clarify. <laughs> you know, that's really profound, um, you know, being in the trenches, and then being able to, to step back and, and uh, really kind of take a new view. I love that. And I really applaud you for um, not just hanging things up. So one of the things that you said, and in again, another like care and fire moment, you made this statement, fundraising is a huge profit center. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is we tend to think of it as being a, a cost center. And that's mm -hmm. partly because we define ourselves by what we're not, non-profit. Mm -hmm. And we don't define ourselves by what we are, which is social benefit, or as Dan Pelota once suggested, the humanity sector. Mm -hmm. And so instead of focusing so much on how we have to scrimp and save and be cost effective, cut, 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 we should be thinking about not just efficiency, but how do we spend and grow and be as big and effective as possible. And when you think about it, fundraising has a remarkable return on investment, ROI. And I'm not just talking about the social ROI, which it has, but it has a financial ROI. Like if you spend 10 cents, you get 90 cents. If you were to divide 90 by 10 cents and multiply by 100, and that's how you get your ROI, you've got an ROI of 900%. I mean, I've often thought businesses who had that kind of ROI would be turning cartwheels. I love that comment. I've never thought about it. I mean, as an econ major, I think, yeah, that whole, the concept of the widget. If you could make a market distribute, obviously sell a widget for 10 cents on the dollar, You'd be the king of Wall Street. Yeah. But then instead, we 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 see nonprofits spend on overhead more than 10 percent, 20 percent. We go we go crazy. Right. We we expect R&D and spending on marketing and advertising and sales for the for profit sector 
But with us, we're like, we pat ourselves on the back for being self-sacrificing and kind of like we're overworked, we're underpaid. And we kind of say that with a great deal of pride. And I just find that very puzzling. I'm like, what's with this hair shirt mentality? Mm-hmm. It doesn't really say that much about the value that we place on the sector. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we don't demand that kind of self-sacrifice from neurosurgeons and airline pilots because we want them to do a really good job and take really good care of us. And then I'm like, right. why are we not wanting our sector to take really good care of our communities and our planet? Right. So. Wow. I love that. I love that you were at, uh, you worked in two concepts, professionalism and care and, you know, the care of duty, if you will, and how we have to look at this. I I appreciate you kind of looping us back into a new mindset, because I think this is a big stumbling block for a lot of our donors as well. When we think about what they're looking for and how they believe that their financial investment um, is going to you know, benefit their community or help achieve the mission ultimately that they want to fund. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm fascinated that you, you bring that up and we, and we think about uh, being too small, take us down this other trajectory, inferior investments lead to inferior results. Um, are we just trying to scrape by from pillar to post or how do we get out of this mindset that's so pervasive across the nonprofit sector, not just within our own organizations or communities. Yeah. So I do think, you know, going back to what we were talking about, that maybe when we begin to value what we do more, then other people will value us more as well. And, you know, I think sometimes we tell ourselves, well, we're just about, we're just a nonprofit. We're about mission and values and doing good deeds. And for profits, we say, well, they're about sales and greed. But in both cases, it's about accomplishments. That's where the value lies. And money is merely a symbol of what you can do with it. It's an enabler. So because we underinvest in the social benefit sector, it's hugely undervalued, hugely under enabled. And you know, it it kind of brings us again back to that overhead myth, cost Mm -hmm. versus outcome. Mm -hmm. My feeling is as long as you're making a difference and you're responding to a demonstrated need and you're creating social value, then the overhead number doesn't matter. If you spend 20% on overhead and knock your mission out of the ballpark, are you really less worthy of support than the charity that spends 10% but helps relatively few people. And the truth is that spending more on, spending less on fundraising doesn't really translate to more on programs. And, you know, I've always been struck by this thing that Dan Pelota said, which was, if it were a zero sum game, that would be true, but it's not. So if you imagine you have this $10 million pie and 8 million goes to programs and 2 million goes away from programs because you spend it on fundraising. The last thing you want to do is spend 3 million on fundraising now only have 7 million left for programs, but that's not how it works. The extra million that you spend, if you do it correctly, enlarges the pie substantially. So you've got a $15 million pie now Mm-hmm. And 12 million you can use on programs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that if you invest, you know, inferior investment, it's like if you only have one staff person assigned to do everything, development, marketing, mm-hmm. you know, sponsorships, grants, events, appeals, I mean, you name it. How likely is it that they're going to adequately cover all of those bases? So. We think we're getting something for free by hiring one person. No, we're just kidding Mm -hmm. ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah, I love this. I think this is a fascinating concept. Um, And I want to build on this with you and ask you the question, how do we 
communicate this to prospective donors or people that we work with, stakeholders. Um, how have you seen that play out? Because that's going to be a new concept for a lot of people, not only just inside the nonprofit sector, but the people that we work with outside. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think we can do is stop touting our low cost of overhead. And I see that a lot. You know, charities will say, you know, we only spend this much on overhead or nothing goes to overhead because then we get other donors to come in silently and fund the overhead. Just stop talking about that way because mm -hmm. that just perpetuates this myth. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's really important to explain to the board why fundraising is a profit center. I mean, if you can show them pie charts, like I was just going like this, they really start to understand that right. this, and also bring in business people to talk to the board and talk mm -hmm. to them how they do this, how they invest in marketing, how they invest in sales, how they invest in research and development, how they invest in systems. In systems, we right. Hugely, we hugely underinvest in fundraising capacity and technology. And, you know, I think like a lot of our board members, business hats, they would, of course, say, oh, yeah, we have to invest in all of us in our businesses. But then they kind of cross the threshold of your nonprofit. Mm -hmm. All common sense goes out their heads. Right. Well, because, you know, we've it's been drilled into us, Claire, that, um, you know, the overhead myth and, and I mean, we don't even really use the word investment as much as we should. I mean, I would just say in my lifetime, um, in board service, investment is kind of somewhat of a dirty word. The thought that, oh, you're not using the money on programming, you're doing something yeah. else with it. And it has been kind of one of those odd things to your point that we need to reframe. Um, I love your idea about bringing somebody in the, uh, you know, to the board or, and to the C-suite to explain this. It's not going to be a one and done thing. It's going to have to be a conversation that's modeled and reaffirmed over time because it is such a significant shift, I think. And I'd love to get your opinion on that. I mean, do you think that this is something that we can shift the mindset of our sector and our and frankly, our donors, um, you know, in what decades, you know, how, how do you see this playing out? Because talk about a big thinking small versus thinking big. Yeah. This is a big thing. Well, I mean, people have been thinking about this for a while. And so, I mean, it's the reason that I started Clarification School, where people just pay, like, it's $100. But then you get access to all of my thinking throughout the entire year. And a lot of this stuff is stuff we've been known. But I think the fundraiser's job is to bring this back to your staff and to your board members. So this shifting the culture to what I like to call philanthropy, not fundraising, right? Is basically philanthropy means phylos, love, anthropy, mm -hmm. humankind. That's what it means. So get away from this fundraising. Mm -hmm. People hate fundraising. It fund right. is money. Money is still the most taboo subject in our society. People don't right. want to talk about it and go with the love. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, if we're going to be loving towards the world, towards our communities, you mm -hmm. have to begin with a really loving stance. Mm -hmm. And over a decade ago, Compass Point and the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund published a three part series of reports exploring culture of philanthropy. And I kind of reframe this in my head, culture of philanthropy. It's like the love train culture. Like everybody gets on board the love train. And, you know, in the studies, they found that um, they, they, they looked at a lot of nonprofits and they were like, what constitutes a nonprofit that has that love culture? Mm -hmm. And 
you know, they said it's something about just walking inside the doors and the feeling that you get from everybody that people don't just say, how was your weekend? They say, hi, is there any way I can help you today? Mm-hmm. And so everybody is just really helping each other. Um, and one of the things that they said in this study, the I think it was the first paper that was underdeveloped a national Mm -hmm. study of challenges facing nonprofits. I pulled this out because I wanted to read it to you. Um, They said, organizations need to make fundamental changes in the way that they lead and resource fund development in order to build the capacity, systems, and culture to support fundraising success. Among the signs that an organization is up to the task is that it invests in its fundraising capacity and in the technologies and other fund development systems it needs. So we're back to that investment. And then it's the staff, the ED, and the board are Mm -hmm. deeply engaged in fundraising as ambassadors and in many cases solicitors Fund development and philanthropy are understood and valued across the organization. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, when I hear you uh, talk about this, I'm reminded um, about the issue of scarcity and fear. And when we go back out into the community and we're like proud of our work and we're like, you should be, you know, I love what you said on the love train with us. You should be, you know, jumping in with us, being successful with us, you know, fighting the good fight with us. Um, It shifts, right? Versus somebody that's like fearful of asking, fearful of creating a relationship, and then um, ultimately thinking small, right? To, to, you know, use that umbrella title that we came up with. Um, Let me ask you in your illustrious career and the trajectory did you ever find this to be the case for your work and how did you personally navigate this um okay <laughs> it's a big did question, I, stop, Claire? <laughs> it's a big question. I mean one of the things that i did that i think was the most there are two things that have come to mind um one of them was i brought in outside people to talk to the board from organizations that they respected so that it wasn't just Mm -hmm. me bringing back this message. Mm -hmm. So I live in San Francisco. People highly esteem the development operation at Stanford. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they have like 120 people on staff there. I happen to know the director of development, the overall director of development, and I had him come speak to our board. It was transformative because they were all like anything Stanford does, we should be doing right. Very much like, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. And of course yeah. they knew how to invest. So that was, that was really, really helpful. The other thing, and I have done this now, what feels like a million times is instead of doing a fundraising training for boards, mm-hmm. I do an inspiring philanthropy session love it and we spent about half of our time on inspiring ourselves about philanthropy and how Mm -hmm. uplifting it is and Mm -hmm. you know sometimes i i i start with letting them get out all their thoughts about fundraising i don't want to do that by just asking them what word comes to mind when we say fundraising and it's all you know it's yucky it's terrible it's scary Mm -hmm. it's I don't know, lots of bad words to put on the whiteboard. Yeah. And then I say, okay, let's put that aside. What comes to mind when I say the word philanthropy? Completely different words. Love, necessary, uplifting, Mm -hmm. you know, community. It's just all sorts of good words. So that's what we want to inspire is the, the love of, the love of, the love of, and it really shifts people's mindsets. 
so that we get to the point where we know we've all heard about those MRI studies that show mm -hmm. that when you're even just contemplating making a gift, you get this shot of dopamine. You know, it just lights up the pleasure center of your brain and feels mm -hmm. good. And talking to people about how it actually feels good for people, like you're really not harming them, as opposed to a lot of trainings and a lot of what people think, which is, I'm going to go hit them up for a gift. Right. Uh, I'm going to go twist their arm. Right. I'm going to make them give till it hurts. I mean, it's just so violent. Yeah. yeah. And if you're thinking like, I'm going to give this person an opportunity that's going to make them feel really, really good, that's going to make them feel really happy when they look in the mirror. I mean, I used to, I worked for many, many years at a social services agency and the program staff, the social workers would say to me, Claire, oh, I'm so glad I don't do what you do. I would hate to right. do what you do. It's so right. hard. And I'd be like, no, your work is hard. I'll just get to go around offering people opportunities to make like a big difference in the world. And I feel like everybody wants to do that they right. just don't know how to do it. They don't know where to do it. They're thinking I'll do something someday. And then you come along and say, hey, look what I've got. You know, yes. I to people, like what would you do if you went to a restaurant that you really loved? What would you, what would you do? You'd come back <laughs> and you'd be excited and you'd tell everybody. Tell everybody, you tell your friends. And, you know, I say, well, you love this nonprofit? Yes, 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 we do. Why are you being so stingy with it? Yeah. You know, tell your friends about it. So right. I think if we remember that it's philanthropy, mm -hmm. that it's love, that it's all these good, positive things, and we're just mm -hmm. asking other people to join in with us in that world, in that loving world, mm -hmm. it feels much better. It's just mm -hmm. a relief to not have to fundraise. Right. Well, I love, you know, it is, it's, it is a, a real shift because um, it changes the way you emotionally feel about your work. Um, the excitement that you're going to have for your work, meeting and working with donors versus the dread and the fear and that horrible sense that you're going to fail. Right. I mean, versus you're going to get out there and I love what you said, give somebody the opportunity to join that mission and join on that tra trajectory is really powerful and um, something fascinating. You know, we don't have a lot of time left, but I don't want to let you go until I've had a chance to talk about this issue that is so prevalent. And that is really like how we invest um, in our, our staff and our, our teams and paying for our talent and, and being, um, I guess going back to that word investment, but I know you're a CFRE. Um, how should we be looking at paying for talent and building up those salaries and and inspiring more people to look at this as a career and and being proud of it as opposed to thinking if I just get back into the for-profit world, you know, I'll make more money. How how do we wrestle with this? Yeah. Well, I mean, for, for one thing, I always tell people you can make, you can make really good money in the yeah. nonprofit sector. And, yeah. you know, you need to look for those places that value it. Um, and then hopefully we as a sector can work to get more nonprofits. I don't even like to call us nonprofits. I like to call us social benef benefit organizations, right. more social benefit organizations to to value paying for talent. And, you know, we keep telling nonprofits to be more businesslike. And, right. then, and then we don't prepare ourselves to offer the type of salaries that attract and retain effective business leaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is something that I actually had to deal with as a development director because I happened to work for an organization that paid really good salaries. And there was one time where the local business paper published a list of all of the nonprofit executive salaries. And my exec happened to be way up at the top. 
And I had donors calling and saying, why is she making that much money? That's ridiculous. I think I'm not going to give to you anymore. And I would have to actually say, look, she's very effective. This mm -hmm. is how much our programs have grown. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. If we don't pay her this, she can go work for the for-profit sector easy and double what she's making, triple what she's making. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, we're not, we don't mind it if a for-profit gives out millions of dollars in golden parachutes to a few failed executives to try to get them out the door. But right? if, we have, if we have the good sense to reward a successful ED with a salary that retains them, we get castigated. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes mm -hmm. no sense. I mean, we yeah. hugely, we hugely reward sports heroes, celebrities. We don't complain if they make over a hundred million or when actors make a million dollars for a 30 second commercial. Mm -hmm. But let, let a social sector person begin to make like a hundred thousand dollars. And suddenly we're like, oh, that's so unethical. That money right. is going to program. So part of it is just how we talk about it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And again, it gets back to that hair shirt mentality where people, right. like, well, we really, you know, don't deserve it. But it's all, it also comes from boards that say, mm -hmm. oh, well, the people working in the social se sector get so much intrinsic reward mm -hmm. that they don't need money. And that's crazy. Mm -hmm. They all have the mm -hmm. same expenses as anybody else. Um, so it's, it's again, getting back to valuing what we do. Right. And so I think, you know, at least organizations should be putting in place more equitable systems of incentives, bonuses, deferred payments, all the kinds of things that make salaries competitive relative yeah. to a larger market. Right. I, I love I love what you said, Claire, because it's really um, to me it's the elevation of a profession that is is so critical to how we we lead um, in this concept of philanthropy in our nation, and 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 we are such a model for the rest of the world. So that if we can you know start to navigate some of these tougher discussions and concepts, um, it doesn't just help our immediate community or nonprofit or region. I mean, it really echoes across the globe and um, can inform uh, many, many other organizations. And so it has really been important to have you here with us today um, so we could learn from you. I always love your spirit and, and the things that you talk about, I think are just so critical for us. And I really um, am delighted that, that we could reconnect you to the viewers of the nonprofit show. Claire Axelrad, JD, CFRE. She's the principal of clarification. Best name ever, I got to say. Um, but if you go on to clarification.com, you can en enjoy a lot of Claire's writing. You can learn more about her teaching series, um, where she's appeared, follow her on some podcasts. Because um, I think one of the things, Claire, that you helped me reframe and remember was that a lot of this we have to communicate to our board right we got to communicate and this isn't a one and done we got to reinstitute some of these thoughts and these theories so that we can get everybody as i like to say rowing in the same direction and with something new that can be quite a challenge and i think if you can just keep thinking as a mantra how can i approach this from a stance of love mm -hmm. you know how can I approach this from a place of abundance, like a rising tide raises all boats. So whenever somebody's saying, we're gonna have to cut, 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 say like, well, what's a way we could do this from a place of abundance? How might we grow so that more love is spread around instead of us feeling like we're contracting? Like that's not a comfortable place to be. And just like try to have that discussion more with everything that you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, wise words, my friend, wise words. Um, do check out Claire Axelrad, CD, CFRE, um, and, and go to clarification.com. You're going to learn more. And I, like I mentioned, um, the site has so many great things going on 
Um, another thing that's great that's going on with us every day on the nonprofit shows, we have these amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out, and they really make a difference in our sector. And so we invite you to learn more about them. Claire, this has been a lot of fun. You know, it's if you're watching this through the archive, um, I got to say today is a Monday. It is a great way to start off the week, my friend. And um, I love your energy and the things that you help us to understand. So thank you for joining us ever so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Julia, for thinking big with me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, everybody, we end each and every day on the nonprofit show with this mantra, and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks so much. We'll see you again.